This episode was previously recorded. Since then, Cake Wallet is now available for Android in addition to iOS. Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iPhone. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your iOS Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible through contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, thousands of hackers congregated in Leipzig, Germany at the 36 Chaos Communication Congress, aka the 36 C3. Monero Talk focused on the critical decentralization cluster, a section of the conference devoted to the future of decentralization, organized by Riot and the Monero community. With the help of Deverick, a Monero community member that attended the conference, we interviewed 10 Monero-related speakers, and we'll be publishing them all. In this episode, I speak with Ricardo Spagni, aka Fluffy Pony. Ricardo recently stepped down as lead maintainer of Monero. He tells us why this means Monero is now stronger than ever. Monero Talk will be interviewing Monero's new lead maintainer, Snippa, next week. Fluffy also tells us why the Monero community should care about Tari. I also speak with Joel Grugger, aka Hashed. Joel tells us the progress he and other cryptographers have made on making atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero possible, allowing Bitcoin to be exchanged into Monero in a truly decentralized and trustless way, making Bitcoin an unstoppable on-ramp from the fiat world to Monero. My takeaway from the 36C3 interviews is that crypto anarchy is thriving and embracing Monero as true digital cash. Monero Talk starts now. All right. We got Ricardo Spagni on, a.k.a. Fluffy Pony, a.k.a. Uh, the former lead maintainer of Monero. <laughs> I got so, kicked off. What can I say? So I guess that's the first question. Uh, we, you know, we can't bring you on without asking you that. So uh, why did you decide to uh, step down as, as lead maintainer of, of Monero? I, I prefer to think of it as the CEO fired me. You know, the CEO of Monero. Um, no, it's, it's been coming for a while. Um, I mean, I spoke about it two years ago. And as I've been going through this process of relinquishing... Um, things. It, it's not so much like relinquishing it entirely. So if I had access to something, I've now added someone else um, to that thing. You know, whether it's the domains or Cloudflare or whatever. And as I've been going through this process, I've realized what a bus factor I was. How much stuff like, you know, there were backups. I mean, there were pe- there were people who could gain access to it, but it's like a mission. Now we've got people who um, are part of the community, have been around for a long time and you have access to it. And I think it's much better because it just decentralizes Monero. It means there's no reliance on me um, for changes. There's no reliance on me for um, release engineering. There's, it's, things can move and happen. And, uh, and there's no like concern about what happens if Fluffy Pony gets hit by a bus. So it's, it's, uh, it really just makes, makes the whole infrastructure more reliable and more robust. Yeah. So now, do you, now I, I, I take it that way. Uh, I think other, others in, you know, that are very uh, aware of what's going on in Monero take it that way. But do you think the, the whole crypto sphere in general is taking it that way or they're seeing it differently? No, I think I've had pretty positive feedback. Um, you know, I think that people, um, uh, even people who aren't like really uh, deeply involved with Monero have realized that this is a good move. There've been a couple of trolls, you know. There was one guy on Twitter who was like, "Yeah, you got fired by Monero," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> so it's um, and there've, there've been a couple, a few people who have said that I've quit, which is not true. I haven't quit. Um, so you know, correct. I, I correct a couple of things like that, and other than that, it's been fine. 
And I guess, so why now? Why, why not a year ago? Why not a year from now? Why'd you decide to do it now? Um, that's a good question. So um, I think that the, so one of the things that I said two years ago was that when the Gideon builds were working, I would step down as lead maintainer. And uh, we've had Gideon builds working uh, with the previous um, point, with one of the previous point releases or two, two or three of them. But the issue that we had was it wasn't working for every platform. This is the first release, the 0.15 release is the first release where Gideon builds have been available for every single platform for the CLI. We haven't gotten, gotten it working for the GUI yet, but we'll get there. And I'm comfortable at least like on the CLI side going, I, I, you know, I'm no longer, I'm no longer necessary for like, you know, that, that little element of trust to be the guy who finalizes the release engineering, who has to make sure that the binaries are built and shipped securely um, uh, to the server and to get up to download. So knowing that it gives me a, it's given me the level of comfort required that I could take a step back and be like, now other people are able to do that. And it's, it's, it's secure. I, it's, there's no longer like, oh, you've got to trust that one guy to like upload binaries or to build them or whatever. How about uh, the state of Monero in general? How, do you, how are you feeling about that? I mean, are, are, where, are, are we at digital cash status yet? Are we, are we ready for prime time? Um, <laughs> I think even you, you mentioned in your speech that you were uh, a little surprised that more people haven't kind of become aware of privacy and started moving over into things like Monero. But are we even, are we ready for that? Is, is Monero built and open for business? Um, I think, look, there's definitely a lot of work from a UX perspective. And that, that doesn't go just, just go from Monero, by the way. That goes for like pretty much the entire cryptocurrency universe. Um, the cryptocurrency universe is not ready for prime time. But I think that we're getting close. And, and I think if you... If you look at like the Monero UX talk um, that, that uh, was at C three as well, if you look at a lot of the work that's being done on like Lightning wallets, um, we're definitely getting uh, better and better each time um, with each iteration, with each passing year. Um, I don't know if you know if you were around in like the '90s when the internet was still in its infancy, but you know it, trying to use the internet in like the mid '90s or early '90s was terrible. You had like you, you had to run WinSock and you had to do like all these weird things on on, on Windows 3.1, which was already horrible, to try and get it to connect. And then you had like um, the world's worst browser, which was NCSA Mosaic, and uh, you had very limited search functionality. You know, if you're using like AltaVista or Ask Jeeves or like you know any of that that horrible stuff. And it was so clunky and so terrible. And now, I mean, like you just up your phone and like off you go you know you just say oh i'm just going to do this and i'm in a foreign country on roaming and it's no problem and it's 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 such a a, a different world and the fact that we're, we're having an interview over over skype on like two different continents and it's crystal clear is just testament to like how far the internet has advanced and i feel like in a very real way cryptocurrencies are like mid 90s right now they're still clunky your grandmother's never going to go buy a modem, a 50, US Robotics uh, um, 36K modem, and like run Winsock. Um, just like she's not going to download Electrum and use Bitcoin. Um, it's just not going to happen. She's not going to download the, the Monero GUI. But you know, you fast forward like five, 10 years, and things are going to look totally different. I guess the, one of the major things I want to ask you too, I guess, is just kind of like what, what's motivating you today? And is it the same thing that? motivated you when you first got into Monero? I imagine when you first got into Monero, you were motivated by, you know, creating, you know, uh, a world reserve currency or creating digital cash. Is that what's still motivating you? Is that what's motivating you now to move on to Tari? Is it still that same basic motivation or is have things changed? No, the, the motivation is the same. I mean, I think that um, self-sovereignty is important. I think that privacy is important for obvious reasons um, and, and for reasons that we don't need to reiterate. Um, and I'm still motivated by the fact that privacy should be a basic human right. Um, people should be able to, to transact and live privately. The fact that, and this frustrates me, that I'll give you an example of, of this. Um, in South Africa, if I have a credit card and I want to go, or a debit card even, and I want to go swipe it overseas, and I'm swiping more than 50,000 Rand, which is about three and a half thousand dollars, I'm not allowed to. And I'm not even allowed to split it up over multiple transactions because they'll catch that. And like I can get into serious trouble. Now, you know, three and a half thousand dollars per swipe, 
doesn't, it sounds like a lot. But if you're doing something like buying a bunch of licenses, paying a big AWS bill, uh, paying a hotel bill for a bunch of people like for a work thing, because this applies to corporate and, and personal cards, then you just can't do it. You literally cannot do it. You have to wire money um, or you have to use, I mean, we have, for AWS bills in South Africa, we have to use a local AWS agent, pay them locally, and then they wire money to Amazon overseas. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's my money. Oh, it's my company's money. I should be able to spend it however I want. I should be able to, to swipe or pay or whatever, as big a bill as I need to. It should have nothing to do with the South African government, how I'm trying to pay a bill. And yet it, they, they just inject themselves in there. And they're like, no, we are the deciders of how you spend your money. That is ridiculous. That is just like, it, it's the craziest thing. Um, I saw a thread on Twitter the other day, similar, where they went to an Arabic restaurant or Persian restaurant or something like that in the Bronx, an Arabic restaurant. And they um, they went to this restaurant and afterwards, because they split the, they didn't split the bill, uh, this person sent one of their friends money over Venmo. And the, in the description, they put the restaurant name. And Venmo sent them an email. They're like, we want to know what you sent this money to with this Arabic name in the description. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like A, Google it, it's a restaurant name. Um, B, like, what is it their business? You know what? <laughs> you send five dollars to your friend, and you put an Arabic name, and now it's like, oh, you must definitely be a terrorist. This stuff frustrates me. There should not be control or influence over what I spend my money on. If 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 a, a, a government or a regulator is concerned that I'm doing something illegal, they should not go, be able to just determine that from like being, having a, a total um, overview into my finances. They should be able to determine that from other things like uh, confidential informants or you know, uh, targeted surveillance because they went to um, a, a judge or a magistrate and had to justify why they want to surveil me. The fact that we're passively surveilled through our finances to financial institutions like banks and cryptocurrency exchanges is mad. And so, yeah, like I rail against that. I think it's just nuts. And it's an environment that we should not be forced to live in. Right. And then so and then my understanding from listening to your talk today is that you kind of see Tari as a way to I think you call it the Trojan horse of, of privacy, the, tr the Trojan pony, maybe <laughs> uh, of privacy. Um, Indeed. And so because I guess obviously you care about privacy and you understand it very well. I do. But given, you know, the people aren't just grasping it. They are they just they don't seem to care. They don't care that Venmo is watching them. They don't care that, you know, they, they like the convenience of things. They, they don't seem yeah. to care about the privacy aspects. So then you're saying, well, Tari may provide uh, bridges or avenues into this world of privacy by creating yeah. apps that people are actually going to use and interact with and then discover privacy through that. Is that uh, that's exactly it. And I think once once you're in a privacy ecosystem, I mean, it's like, like do people that, that use an Apple phone, do they, do they know or care that the facial recognition and the object recognition is done on the device and not in the cloud? They don't know. They just know that if they search for someone's name or search for dog in their photos, they get pictures of dogs. They don't know how it's happening. But they, and they don't know that if they're using an Android device, the same thing happens, but Google goes and does it in the cloud and has access to all your photos. They don't know that. Frankly, I, I don't know if they care, but at some point the penny's gonna drop. At some point that person is going to need privacy for their photos or whatever it is, and then they're gonna be grateful that they used a privacy enhancing system, and then they're gonna go tell their friends, like I could've, you know, I, this could've been a mess for me. Thank goodness I used this privacy enhancing system. So that's kind of the world that I want to create, where people are just suckered into the privacy enhancing world, the privacy enhancing stuff, and they don't even realize that that's what's, what's happening. And one day is one day when they actually need it, and then they go, thank goodness I was using that. Thank goodness I was exposed to Monero. Thank goodness I was using Tari. And I think that that's, that's really... Um, the way that we're going to get people on board. And frankly, this is really, it's good for Monero if we get more normies to use it because Monero's privacy depends on there being a lot of people using it. So the more people that we can attract to the Monero uh, world, the more people that we can get using Monero, the better it is for the rest of us. 
I, t- I, yeah, I totally agree with that, and I, I appreciate all the work you're doing on it. Do you also not think, though, that people will all, they'll be like, because at the end of the day, it is money. It's different than you know social networking and Facebook, where all right, uh, I'm losing my privacy. People know that I like skateboarding and whatever, but money is is a whole nother level of 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 concern so the day that you know bitcoiners or whoever they wake up and they realize that uh you know governments know and essentially anybody who wants to know knows how much money i have and who and how much i'm sending to who so do you think there might be a a wake-up moment with that i know we haven't seen it yet but i feel like we could we be getting closer yeah. to that with all chain analysis um, becoming better well known? Like, do you think that's going to be kind of a, a pivotal thing as well? Just people realizing, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, with some, with uh, thing, you know, some of these other things that people are using to transfer. Uh, if it's not transparent, I mean, if it's you know, if it is transparent, it's a problem, and it's about the the money in your pocket. Uh, do you think that's going to start to hit home for people? Okay, so so okay, let's split this into two things. Uh, let's take a look at normies, right? They're using Venmo, PayPal, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever. Um, if you look at the terrible privacy stories that have gone around uh, with Facebook, I mean, Facebook's been hauled in front of Congress, um, you know, and and like railed on on their lack of care with uh, regards to people's privacy. Um, there was a delete Facebook movement on Twitter. Have we seen a drop in Facebook's numbers? You know, I mean, has there been like a, you know, has Facebook has Facebook gone public and been like, oh guys, you know, we lost like a quarter of our users? No, they haven't because people are oblivious. So I don't think there's going to be a a, a a movement or a wake up call for for normal people. I don't think they're going to even one with day go mo- even with money though. You, you think that even with money, even with money, I think that people are people need to be tricked into into embracing this. Um, I think that the people that, that value privacy are already using uh, gold as a, a store of value. They're already using cash. They will transition naturally into the system. They won't need convincing. But people that aren't people that are just embracing like all of the the really convenient things, you know, people that are like, oh, I can pay with my phone at Starbucks, tap. Those people are never going to go like, I can pay with my phone at Starbucks, but wait, someone will know that I paid at Starbucks. I won't do that. I'll pay with cash. They're never going to do that. They're never going to use cryptocurrency for privacy enhancements. They, there will be people who will use cryptocurrency as a hedge against collapse. Um, in in countries in Latin America and countries in Africa, they will go like, my country is collapsing, and I really need to flee, um, financially speaking, into something that is a hedge that is stable. Oh, hey, look, it's Bitcoin, Monero, whatever. Um, I, th- I don't think we're going to win the hearts and minds of people. Um, in, in any meaningful way just through the process of having a privacy enhancing currency. I think we will need to trick them into it. Now this is other group of people and that is uh, Bitcoiners. And I, I think that there are a large group of Bitcoiners already who like Monero um, and who admit that Monero uh, fills a privacy hole right now. A lot of them think that Bitcoin will fill that privacy hole in, in the future through the Lightning Network and building stuff on top of Lightning or whatever. And perhaps they're right. I, I'm certainly not one to pretend to know the future. Uh, I personally don't think that, that uh, Bitcoin will ever achieve meaningful privacy in the next decade or two, but I might, I've been wrong in the past, I might be wrong now. Um, but there's a subset of that group who believe that um, there's no such thing as tainted UTXOs or tainted Bitcoins. Bitcoin is private enough right now, um, and Lightning will solve everything. You can argue with those people till the cows come home, and you're not going to convince them that privacy is an imperative that Bitcoin lacks. They are stubborn and pig-headed in their beliefs, and uh, it's like arguing with a flat earther. And I'm sure they feel like arguing with us is like arguing with a flat earther. So I'm, um, you know, with with a lot of those conversations, I tend to just disconnect and go like, oh, you know, we're not we're not going to see eye to eye. So I've stopped trying to convince those people. I think that they that the, the Bitcoin is that like Monero already will continue to like Monero. And um, my my mission right now is not to convince people who currently use Bitcoin or currently use any form of cryptocurrency that Monero is special. They know Monero is special. It's it's kind of unavoidable. It's been around for too long to to pretend it isn't. Um, and 
my current mission is to try and convince normal people that um, privacy is important by tricking them into using it. So what do you see as being one of those killer apps or ways, bridges to uh, get people over onto Tari, using Tari? What, what, are the, what is it going to be like for the end user? I think for the end user, a lot of it's going to be abstracted away. Um, but there's a lot of levers that we can play with. So, um, you know, if you'll recall Project Coral Reef, uh, we were able to provide um, discounts, significant discounts, like 15, 10 to 15%, sometimes 20%. When people were shopping um, on musicians' uh, merchandising stores, if they paid with Monero, now we can use similar levers. You know, we can say like, um, if you get this app and you, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's loyalty points, digital collectibles, doesn't matter. You know, this thing that's built on Tari. Um, if you want more out of it, and we can, you know, especially if it's digital stuff, we can go a lot steeper than fifteen percent. We can provide discounts. We can provide things that are only available for Monero, so so unique items that are only available to purchase from Monero. And I can tell you right now that anyone who is a fan of a sports team or a movie or a TV series or um, a musician or an artist, if they are told that to get this exclusive thing for the thing that they're a fan of, they need to use this weird currency called Monero they will figure out how to get hold of it. They will figure out how to spend it. They will. That will not be a challenge. They will. You know. They, they will do all sorts of crazy things. But these are the same people who go and stand in queues for like two days. They camp out in queues for two days to get first access to stuff. So you know, to say to them, "Hey, please use this weird internet currency that sounds like it's got a Spanish name," they'll be like, "No problem. I can do that." And I think that that's how we're going to win people is by um, being you know, like that getting the stuff built on Tari and using these levers to get people introduced to Monero, to get people to use privacy enhancing tools without realizing they're using it. When do you think we might see the first Tari app that, or Tari actually working in the wild? So at the moment there's um, uh, like one of the things that we've got is Big Neon, which is a ticketing company that we built. Um, Big Neon's kind of currently centralized, but everyone that we've done a ticketing deal with, all the venues we've done ticketing deals with, know that at some point that centralized ticketing is going to switch over to um, to become decentralized and to be issued on Tari. Um, a lot of the other things that we're doing at the moment um, where we're like, hey, we can build this cool thing in a centralized way on the, the condition that you're happy with us switching to decentralized um, Tari stuff in the future. Um, that, that's pretty much the, the way we're approaching it. And I think that there's a lot of scope for that. Um, and we're not the only ones. There are a bunch of people that are, are playing around with um, building things on Atari. It's still early days. Testnet's not out. Um, yeah, I guess know, that's, I guess that's what I'm away, asking. What, what, what are we going to be done? What are we? Gonna, is that is that is there, <laughs> is there a light at the end of the um, tunnel yet? With there is, there is. I mean, we're we're getting pretty close. I feel like we're getting pretty close to a point where uh, where Testnet is viable. The the first ver the early versions of Testnet will be very basic. You know, we're talking blocks, transactions, consensus. That's it. Um, you know, digital assets uh, and, and the um, asset issuer stuff will come at a later point. But, you know, you've got to start somewhere. And, and we're getting pretty close to that um, in terms of, of the code that's written. So, yeah, I'm hoping that we'll soon have something um, that people can actually play with that's tangible, even if it is basic, even if it's just mobile wumble at first. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that we're, that we're doing on top of that, and it'll at least give us a platform um, and give, give people a, a, an opportunity to play and fiddle. Um, and then they can go from there. Why didn't Tari, why doesn't Tari have a white paper? Is it, was there a reason why you guys didn't? Uh... Um, yes, uh, there's a big reason for it. The reason is that I felt like writing a white paper and then going to a community of open source developers, even though Tari Labs you know, has some paid developers working on it, but going to a community and saying like, here's the white paper, it's a fait accompli, go write code. It's you know they're, they're not really invested in it. I wanted people to be invested in it. I wanted people to feel like like I helped bring this thing to fruition. Um, and honestly, like some of the ideas that I had initially for how this thing could work, um, we have like the, the current RFCs are so much better. So I'm glad that we didn't um, write a white paper and push it out that way. Um, it's made the journey harder and longer. But I think that ultimately we'll end up with something that is far superior to any white paper that I could have written. 
So as of now, what we really know in terms of its architecture is that it's uh, merged mined with Monero, right? It's uh, yeah. going to be, what else do we know? We know. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff. I encourage people who want to dig into the architecture to go to rfc.tari.com and uh, go, go read up on the on the stuff. There's parts of the RFCs that are still work in progress that people can contribute to. But if you want to see how the stuff's fitting together, um, there's, I mean, like the, the RFCs are pretty detailed and there's a lot of stuff that's written up that's worth reading. How about the details like, will, there be, will it be capped? What's the coin supply gonna be? Is there gonna be a dev tax? Things like that, is that? Good. When... Yeah, good questions. Um, a lot of that stuff's still work in progress. Um, we have some ideas around a mission curve. We have some ideas around, um, uh, you know, could, we, could we design something like a dev tax? Um, what could that look like? Uh, you know, how would it be voted on, if, if anything? Um, we've got a bunch of ideas we're playing around. The advantage that we have here is it's not a base layer protocol, so there's lots of, of wiggle room. I would certainly never, you know, with, with some of the ideas that we've had, I would never try that on a base layer like Monero, but there's lots of wiggle room to do stuff um, on Tari. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see like like what ideas people come up with and, and uh, so on in the, in the near future. And we're gonna, I mean, we're gonna put that out there, what, whatever, whatever we think is, uh, and whatever the community thinks is a good idea, We'll put it out there for comments. It'll just be another RFC, and uh, and we'll see what people like and what people hate. All right, that's all I got. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Are you having a good time at the conference? Uh, I'm having a great time at the conference. I can honestly recommend that anyone who is even slightly into infosec really consider making a turn um, down to CCC. Um, it's you know Germany's cold this time of year, but it is a beautiful part of the world nonetheless. Um, and CCC is very special. Um, if you've ever been to DEF CON, it is, in my mind, um, a similar but very different experience. And I hesitate saying this for all of the people that love DEF CON, but I think it's kind of better than DEF CON. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. It, you've, got to do, you've got to do CCC at least once in your life. Maybe next year. You just, you, you've, awesome. you've gone a couple of times? You've been there a bunch of times? This is, yeah, this is my eighth or ninth time okay, um, at wow. CCC. Um, and yeah, it just every year it gets crazier and more awesome, and there's more cool stuff to play with. So, what what is like Monero's presence like there, as opposed to you know compared to past years? Um, the the um, uh, CDC, the critical decentralization cluster, is much bigger this year than any of the Monero areas previously. Um, and uh, there's a, I mean, there's multiple workshops, there's multiple tables with different. Uh, different subgroups. Uh, Parallel Nepolis has got a, a big area at the back and they've got a, a cool um, coffee, a little coffee shop going and you could pay in Monero. Um, you could also pay with Bitcoin and, uh, and Lightning um, and that's a lot of fun. I've had way too many cups of coffee from them um, and it's it's been great. They, they're they a good group. Um, they do HC, uh, HCPP in Prague every year in October, uh, which is also worth going to. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, it's 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 a pretty big area. Um, it's pretty awesome. The stage is uh, is is big. The uh, there's you know sort of 30, 40 um, seats in front of the stage, um, and the, some of the talks have really been excellent um, and thoroughly enjoyable. And it's awesome to see how much work is going on um, in the Monero ecosystem. All right. How about the, the uh, I guess one last, the, that one talk on the atomic swaps from Bitcoin to Monero, is yeah. that, is that, was that kind of a new breakthrough that's, that was talked about today or is that something that everybody was already kind of aware of? Um, I, you know, I think that there's some, there's some innovative stuff there. I don't know. I mean, you know, like, like he's certainly been quiet or they've been, they've been quiet on it. So um, it is good to get it out there and, and uh, have it spoken about more openly and have some of the stuff detailed. Uh, it's not been a secret, but um, yeah, it's, it's good that uh, it was a good talk that they gave. Uh, I didn't realize that how far they were in the Monero Rust stuff as well, so that's uh, that's been quite nice to see. Um, yeah, there's uh, like like it's uh, it's it's certainly uh, there are aspects of it that are certainly innovative. Um, I, I think that the whole atomic swap scene is more is uh, more mature than it was a few years back, where it was almost a pipe dream. Um, and where there was very little, uh, you know, like peg, peg stuff was certainly possible, but like we, we had seen a lot more trustless atomic swap schemes than previously. So I'm excited about it. All right. 
All right, thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the conference. Cool. Uh, good luck with everything. Thanks so um, you know, th thanks for all your hard work. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm excited by the fact that you're, you know, that you think that Monero is ready for you to now kind of step away a little bit. I think that I think that's a great indicator of things. Uh, like yeah. you said, showing that it's decentralized and really excited to see what you guys come up with at Tari. So best of luck. Thanks so much. All awesome. right. Then. Thanks, A. Ciao. Cheers. All right, Joel, thanks for coming on. How Thank you, doing? you for having me. So yesterday, yeah. yesterday you did a talk on uh, cross-chain atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero. If you exactly. could... What is an atomic swap? If you could just kind of briefly explain the, the concept at a basic level. So the concept of having a cross-chain atomic swap is to allow two participants who have uh, uh, funds in two different chains and they want to trade those funds. And we want to have a protocol that is trustless and either will succeed or completely um, failed and we don't we don't want to have like one that takes all the funds so that's where the atomicity um, comes from we want either a successful swap or no swap at all now I feel like this is something we've been hearing about for many years it's always been this kind of theoretical idea how concrete is it now? Are we are we getting close to actually having uh, cross-chain atomic swaps? Is it actually being done anywhere elsewhere? It's just not being done yet between Bitcoin and Monero. What's kind of the current status of the field? So yeah, it's done for other chains. Um, for example, you can do uh, easily with with uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, because both have the. Um, um, the ability to to do some uh, locking or timing constraint on the transaction and what's what make it difficult for bitcoin and, and monero is um we don't have for example a full uh, script full scripting abilities for monero so we have to find other construction to be able to do it, so it's we proposed uh, a way to do it between Bitcoin and Monero without having these uh, um, prerequisites, uh, but we require a bit of uh, other cryptography. So that's that's what it is. When you what do you mean you require a bit of other cryptography? Uh, in that case, it's uh, zero knowledge proofs. Okay. So. We need uh, to, uh, during the, the, the setup phase of the swap between the two participants, we use a trick to, to not requiring uh, time locks or uh, uh, pre-image re uh, pre reveal or other stuff in the manner of uh, uh, blockchain, but we need to ensure that the participant did the initialization phase correctly. So we need a zero knowledge proof that uh, that make the protocol completely trustless. Mm. So when, when do we get to that, that? So what's the next stage, I guess? What's the next step in trying to make this a reality? So to make this a reality, we need to implement the, this zero knowledge proof. So right now with uh, the guys I'm working uh, with, we don't have um, uh, the full knowledge to do the concrete implementation. So we know that in theory it's possible, but um, we are, um, we would like some, we would enjoy um, to have some help on the zero knowledge part uh, in, for the, the theoretical part, how to create the, the circuits and, and, and that stuff and also for the implementation. Have you guys been working with the Monero community all, at all, or uh, the Monero Research Lab? So we we talk uh, about, uh, a bit with the Monero Research Lab, and um, we we had some um, some thoughts. They they they, but we we ne we never um, go deep into the the discussion and. Uh, 
what we can do. The thing is, with bulletproofs, uh, we can do uh, zero knowledge proof with with uh, arbitrary circuits. Uh, but the Monero code base, uh, at least last time uh, we discussed uh, beginning of the year, um, didn't support the the full uh, uh, the full features uh, bulletproof offers. So we 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 stopped uh, at that moment and we we just. Um, we said, okay, let's wait a bit more time and uh, see if other implementation comes and uh, allow us to, uh, for us, easily implement the, the zero knowledge parts. Okay. So if you had to give, uh, you know, this is probably a question you would, you would hate to answer, but if you had to give an estimate, what do you think timeline is of when we would actually see uh, atomic swaps happening in the real world between Bitcoin and Monero? Yeah, that's a trick question. <laughs> I would say maybe in 2020 we can see um, uh, an implementation that is uh, working. Uh, if we if we remove the zero knowledge parts, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, allow you to trade with uh, uh, people you don't trust. So it's it's a bit meaningless. But without that part, we can have an implementation in in maybe some weeks. Hmm. But the it's zero no knowledge point. part yeah. is really the part that is um, that is the most uh, uncertain in terms of times. And now let's say, you know, we, you guys do achieve this. What will be the actual real world implementation? It would be something like uh, an exchange where a marketplace where people are coming together that that want to exchange Bitcoin and Monero and then use this to do it in a trustless way, peer to peer. So yeah, that would be um, that would be one possibility to have some kind of exchange that just do the matching between people with a certain quantity and and the price, and then they they go and do the trade peer to peer. Or we can imagine also some services that propose, like XMR.2, uh, but the other way around that propose um, to uh, receive Bitcoin to send Monero uh, back. So we can imagine uh, services that that where you can buy, you can do crypto to crypto, but without trusting, without the need to trust the, the exchange. Mm -hmm. So that would be another possibility. Interesting. So you mentioned that uh, other coins are doing this, like you can do it through uh, Ethereum to Bitcoin. Are we seeing that in the real world yet? Are they using it in, in a way like that where it's uh, being used to do trustless exchanges? That's a good question. I'm not... I know that there exist some platforms that um, do the trade between people with swaps, um, but I don't know uh, how much, how many people uh, are using these uh, instead of just uh, go to a central exchange and and do it um, with 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 uh, less fees and uh, instant uh, response from the exchange because there is no on-chain operation or, or little delays depending on what they're doing. Mm. So it exists on platforms, but I, I don't know uh, the, who use it or, or not. I guess with the, the Bitcoin to Monero, Monero to Bitcoin, is it's a, it's a more attractive idea because now you can go from a transparent coin to an anonymous coin without using KYC AML, essentially doing it truly peer to peer, as opposed yeah. to going from something like Bitcoin to Ethereum, it's not as attractive. Sure, yeah, that was the, 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 the introduction of our presentation where uh, my colleague um, exposed some uh, quotes and tweets from WikiLeaks that said, uh, in like years ago, uh, we now accept uh, anonymous payments in Bitcoin, and um, he 
he he he we put some graphs or or channel analysis uh, results with the WikiLeaks address on on Bitcoin, and yeah, we 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 can do channel analysis very easily. So having these swaps. Uh, for sure helps to break this chain analysis because you can like swap the Bitcoin to the Monero and maybe later uh, come back to Bitcoin and these links are uh, uh, harder to, to, to do so it, it really helps in terms of privacy and, and counters a bit the chain analysis. Yeah, no, I think this is a very exciting idea. I'm sure the Monero community will be excited to hear your updates. Is there anywhere where people could follow your progress and learn more about the project? So yeah, the, there is a, the, the white paper is on GitHub. Um, my GitHub is um, uh, github.com slash hashed uh, H4SH3D. And there is the uh, Bitcoin Monero white paper. And there is also um, uh, a, a partial implementation in Rust for the library, where uh, pretty much all the Bitcoin transactions are uh, implemented and a part of the logic uh, for the protocol. And um, I started the Monero RS uh, project also on GitHub for having a Rust Monero library that that will be used uh, when when ready. Uh, in this uh, swap library. So there is this three project, the white paper, the implementation in Rust, and a Monero Rust project more for general purposes. So these three resources are, are online and every contribution is really welcome. We'll try to follow up with you and get those links and we'll put them in the show notes so people could, uh, can find sure. them there and we'll link to your, your talk as well. So are you funded by the Monero community at all? Have you, have you done any, uh, raised any funds to pursue the project or you're just doing no, it on your own? It's, it's a fun project. It started at CCC two years ago where uh, we, we, we had the Bitcoin table and the Monero table that uh, were uh, aside. So we, we started uh, thinking about the swaps. So uh, I started uh, drawing the first protocol two years ago and uh, last year uh, I restarted work, working on it and uh, I, I changed the protocol and uh, we presented the, this new work but uh, it will, it's, um, it's, for me it's mostly a, a side project and we, we work on it when we see that something we may depend on uh, has changed or we, we follow for example, the zero knowledge proofs uh, evolution, and so we we don't have any funds, and we just do it like for fun when we have time and when we have friends around that can help. What else do you work on? What's uh, what's kind of your, your day job? Do you work? Are you are you a Bitcoin developer, a Monero developer? Are you? I'm a things? security engineer uh, in a small company in Switzerland, uh, where we provide some. Um, uh, secure secure servers. So I work as a security engineer uh, in my day job. Mm -hmm. And then, do you develop for Monero code base as well, or? I I did one pull request on the Monero code base, but it was a very small one, just on the wallet parts. Uh, so I would like to to uh, invest a bit more time in the Monero code base. Uh, but I am more a Rust uh, developer than a C++ developer, so um, yeah. Okay. That's why also I, I started the, the Monero Rust library, mm -hmm. not for um, uh, as a complement of uh, the Rust code base, the, the C++ code base. I, I don't want to, I want to ex extend the possibility uh, in terms of uh, languages. Mm -hmm. So. That's my contribution. I it's not really in the core ba code base, but uh, uh, yeah. And Tari is looking to use Rust, right? Is that correct? Yeah, Tari is using Rust. Okay. And um, they are using some parts of the library, so that's awesome. Okay. 
All right. Well, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm certainly excited to see uh, this develop further. I think it, I think it would be a great thing for Monero and Bitcoin. And wish you wish you luck in your pursuit. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iPhone. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your iOS Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Oh, <laughs> my